So there's been a lot of videos about the COVID-19 coronavirus urging people to go out and buy groceries and make sure you have a 30-day supply so you can quarantine your family. Well, I think it's an excellent idea to have a 30-day and longer supply for your family in your food pantry. But I still maintain that I don't see COVID-19 coronavirus to be a threat if you're living in the United States at this time. But I have to admit, I am compelled to go to Johns Hopkins sites multiple times a day and see what is the death rate? What is the recovery rate? How many people are infected? And when I checked this morning, it was 69,267 deaths confirmed worldwide, 1,670 deaths, and 9,847 recovered cases. And that is Sunday morning on February 16th. But you know what? I have a lot of questions. What do we know and what do we not know? And here are my questions. Are those numbers accurate? How many of those 69,000 plus infected rate required actual hospitalization? What are the ages of those infected and those who actually die? How contagious is COVID-19? How long is the incubation period? And what is the source of this coronavirus? So I'm sharing with you what I found and what I've not found to answer my questions. So first off, are those numbers accurate? You know, I suspect they are not. Um, China has a long history of being secret and not uh, giving out all the information. And they might not have had enough test kits to actually test the population. And you know, they're not allowing media coverage, so who knows what is really happening in China. We just get some leaks through social media, and then we're not sure if those are true or not. So it's hard to know what is the true numbers. And I'm going to be referring to my notes occasionally because I have done some research on this area. And the WHO says right now, most deaths seem to uh, occur from multiple organ failure, and it's at about a 2% rate. However, most infectious disease experts say it's really hard to know what the rate is. You can't just take the number of infected and divide it from the number of deaths and come up with the infection rate. So what we've been focusing on in the Wuhan area of China is those that are symptomatic but there may be a lot of people that just are slightly symptomatic or not symptomatic at all, and they still have the coronavirus. So that would change your percentage of fatality rate. Now remember, you could have COVID-19 and you could just feel like you have a slight cold, but you could also feel like you got hit by a train and have a really bad case of the flu. So it's a continuum. Some people might not even know they have it, and other people are at death's door. Of course, it might also be under detection because of many of the hospitals have really reached their maximum and they don't have all the testing kits they need. Many people think the cases reported and deaths in Wuhan area are only the tip of the iceberg. We really don't know the full numbers. And then people question, is it because of facilities and the medical care available, would that death rate be the same in other regions? And there can be different susceptibility to such a disease. Um, are people as susceptible, let's say, in the United States as they are China? There can be genetic predispositions to certain diseases. We really don't have the data at this time. But I found an interesting article that really is saying the death rate might, might be really, really higher in China. Radio Free Asia recently reported that funeral homes in central China are working around the clock to cremate bodies. In fact, the Wuhan funeral home actually advertised for 20 new members of staff to man a four-hour night shift collecting bodies from homes. 
they offered 4,000 won, which is equal to about $572 US for four hours work. Now, when you consider the average monthly salary for city dwellers in China is around US $1,228.38, this is a substantial amount of money. The ad calls for applicants aged 16 to 50 years old, regardless of gender, with bold and strong, and that's in quotes, personalities who have no fear of ghosts. Social media users said that there are 84 incinerators located at seven funeral homes across Wuhan with the capacity to perform 2016 cremations in any 24-hour period. They're saying that all these funeral homes have been working around the clock in recent weeks with dead bodies lying in rows waiting for cremation. So is that social media correct? Is the death rate much higher and China is just withholding that information? Don't know. Now my next question is how many of those infected, you know, based on this morning, 69,000 plus, actually require hospitalization? I can't really find any statistics on this. Even when you think of that uh, boat, the Princess Cruise Line that's harbored in Tokyo, um, and really, really, exponential um, infection rate. I can't find out how are the people doing in the hospital in Japan. I just cannot find out at this time any additional information except there has been no deaths of those people on that cruise ship. So what are the ages of those infected and the ages of those who die? Information is only preliminary but it appears that about 80% of the people who have died from the virus in China were over the age of 60 and 75% had pre-existing conditions. And that's according to a report from the China's National Health Commission. A small report published in January 30th in the medical journal The Lancet found the average age of patients was roughly 55 years old. It appears that over 80 years of age is the highest risk factor. And you know, that's no different than uh, for getting the flu here in the United States right now. The older you are, the more susceptible you seem to be. And that can be because our immune systems aren't as good as we age. Now, what we've noticed for the coronavirus is that children are not getting it, or if they are getting it, very mild symptoms. And again, that is common with the flu because children, not infants, have usually better immune systems. And so something like the corona coronavirus or the flu does not hit them as hard. And when I found out that that was true about the SARS, which was another coronavirus, um, during that 2003 outbreak, 8,098 people, and it killed about 800 over nine months. The vast majority of the cases infected older adults. And the case fatality ratio for people aged 24 or younger was less than 1%. So we're kind of seeing that same thing for the coronavirus, COVID-19. Now, there's always outliers. You know, you'll hear about the person only 29 years old dying and they didn't have any comorbidities. They didn't have diabetes or heart disease or something else. But we don't know the genetic component. And believe it or not, your genes can give you a predisposition to be susceptible to a certain disease, such as this coronavirus. So we really don't have that information. But there are always outliers. So, how contagious is it? Well, based on that Princess cruise ship in Tokyo, I would say, wow, it is really, really contagious. But the honest truth is, we don't know much about it at all. All the experts are doing is making suppositions based on what we know about other coronaviruses. And based on that, we think it's like many respiratory diseases that it spreads through droplets through the air and you should be at least six feet away from anybody and then you will be safe. But we really, really don't know at this time. 
what happens is those droplets go through the air, they get inhaled into your lungs, and then they can replicate and cause organ damage eventually. Now, we don't know if touching certain surfaces can also give you the coronavirus. You know, how long does it live on a surface? At this time, we just really, really don't know. So it is interesting what the CDC considers the person to be actually recovered. And it's on a case-by-case -case basis, but if the patient is free from a fever without using any medication, the patient no longer shows any symptoms, including a cough, and the patient has tested negative on at least two consecutive tests 24 hours apart, they're considered cured and they can go back out into the general public. So how long is the incubation period? We've gotten conflicting information on that. And right now we believe it is two to 14 days. And that seems to vary greatly among patients. The mean incubation period observed is 3.0 days. And the mean incubation period in travelers from Wuhan was 6.4 days but there has been outliers of 24 days. And the question is, did they just get reinfected again or is it really two to 24? We still don't know what the total incubation period is. What is the source of the coronavirus? Guess what? Again, we don't know. Um, coronaviruses uh, come from a large family of viruses and they cause illnesses in people, but also in animals. And animals can be the host, including camels, cats, and bats. An analysis of this genetic code of the COVID-19 indicates it originated in bats. But whether that virus jumped directly from bats to humans or whether there was another intermediary animal is still being decided. You know, if you think of SARS, it originated in bats, but then it jumped to civets, cats, and then it went to humans. And if you think of MERS, yep, it might have started with bats, but then it went to camels, and then it went to humans. So we're not sure right now about the COVID-19 coronavirus. So I've shared with you a lot of what we know, which is small, and a lot of what we don't know, which is big. So be careful when people are making these statements. We really do not have enough information to make a lot of educated statements about the coronavirus. You know, one of the things that I keep watching is the infections on the uh, Princess cruise ship in Tokyo. You know, it started out like at six cases or something, and what is it now? As of Sunday morning, up to 369. And to me, that's kind of like a horror movie. I mean, I've only taken two cruises in my life. Uh, one was down the Egyptian Nile. And basically, we only slept on the ship. We were off all the time during the day and sometimes during the night. And then I took a cruise in Alaska so we could see the glaciers and that type of thing. And you know, you're in a very small room. And as someone that's slightly claustrophobic, Boy, I cannot imagine being just in that area. And depending on where you are on a ship, you don't even have a window to look outside. Uh, and if you're older, if you're not getting enough activity, excuse me, the cat just <laughs> moved my camera there. But if you're older and not getting enough activity, you can have other problems too. But to me, that's kind of like a horror movie, right? It just kind of creeps up on you, goes and goes and goes. But again, so far no deaths from that. We have no idea, it's not being reported, how these people are doing in quarantine and hospitalization in Japan. And my understanding is a plane from the United States, a chartered plane is coming this evening and going to take people back to a quarantine in the United States from the cruise ship. But that cruise ship is a perfect case study for how does that coronavirus spread? So I will want to be part of that case study, but definitely interesting. 
Anyway, this is Prepper Potpourri. This is just what I have found out so far. And just be very, very careful what you hear in line. Don't be scared if you're living in the United States about COVID-19. You know what? At this time, it is not a threat. So, still prep. Make sure you have all your food and your other preparations in place. That's just smart. You don't have to do it out of fear. This is Prepper Potpourri saying, please subscribe, share the knowledge, and thumbs up if you like this video. And thank you so much for listening to my rambling.